Hey guys, Harv here, and welcome back to the Kerbal Space Program. This is the third and final part of our interplanetary shenanigans. And what we're doing right now, well, the status of our mission is that we have our lander safely down on Juna, and we have our command module safely in orbit around Juna. So, what's left? Well, we need to get them back home. Why do we bring them out here but to get them back home? So, in order to do that, we need to get the planets in the correct alignment. It just so happens that that correct alignment is Juna needs to be around 75 degrees ahead of Kerbin. You can see here, we have Kerbin chasing Juna around on its shorter, lower orbit, faster orbit, and they get about 75 degrees apart. Also, it doesn't have to be perfect, just close enough, because the fact is, Kerbin has a much stronger gravity than Juna. Ergo, it is actually easier to get back from Kerbin, uh, get back from Juna to Kerbin, than it is from Kerbin to Juna. Less, uh, there's more room for manoeuvring, there's more leeway, because of the higher, the bigger sphere of influence that Kerbin has. Here we go. What are we going now? We are, well, before going back up, before docking with our command module, we're going to repack all these chutes, which is a feature I only learned about a few days ago or so, maybe a week ago now. God, it's been a while. It has been a while. Yeah, I, I forgot to apologise. Actually, this video won't go up for a, a long while, so I shouldn't be apologising. I should have apologised earlier. I did forget to apologise. Again, it was a week. It was a, I, I had a week without recording or uploading videos, that is. That, that's not good. But having safely packed our chutes back up, we can get back in and warp round till the command module is safely... Why am I saying safely so much? Really, really odd. Till the command module is overhead. Now, we have it a bit closer than usual because, A, Juno has got a lower atmosphere. It's not so high. It doesn't reach up to the 69.4 kilometres that Earth's does, or Kerbin's does. It's a mere 40 kilometres on this one on this planet, and that allows for us to have a much quicker uh, orbital insertion. You can see the LV-99 had a bit of a struggle, and I was actually genuinely worried that I'd built a lander that couldn't, that wasn't capable of doing this mission. I hadn't tested it before, you see. I had never tested this. This is why I love the game, because you can just make, slap random things together, hope they work, and they will, one times out of ten. But we're getting into orbit, and obviously it takes a lot longer than I thought it would, because I didn't realise that the LV-9 was so weak. Oh, I knew it was weak, just not on Juna, still. But no matter, as Ike overhead watches me accusingly of being too inept to complete a simple mission, we are now heading for the one of the most complicated parts of the mission, which is rendezvous and docking. Uh, those are things I've been practicing a lot recently with the interplanetary fleet, so I'm pretty, I have to say I'm pretty good at it, but maybe having a different planet to do it around will change things up a little. And in fact we get a little bit lucky, as you shall see, as you shall see later on. Now, you'll notice that our inclination isn't going to be perfect, in fact it's going to be atrociously bad. Uh, we have... Where are we? We are somewhat like 10 degrees above the equator, which is a big deal. It means that despite burning 90 degrees, our orbit is going to cross over at only two points. That's what inclination means. It, it's differing angles. So if you have a different inclination to a target orbit, then you will cross it at two points. Reminds me of maths, solving linear equations. But anyway, um, we, we have the ship and we have a close approach there. It shows, the, the dotted line shows where the target will be when you're at that point. You can see it moving around there. Now I'm setting up a different node in order to uh, try and get into a circularized orbit. We get a closer encounter on the opposite side because we put ourselves into a lower orbit due to the fact that the target was actually ahead of us. Lower orbit means we'll be able to catch it up. So there we go. Doing that all over again, we have our target nearly set up, uh, 2.7 kilometers separation. That's pretty good. That is pretty good indeed. We can line up with the reticule and warp up 
to our apoapsis, and we can get rid of that. You see, right there, we're in the lower orbit because the target is ahead of us. That is the main thing to remember with space physics, orbiting rendezvous, that, that nonsense. <laughs> there we go. We've, we've burnt in roughly the same direction that the reticle is telling us to. We have a 5km, 3km, 2.9km separation. That's good enough for me. If you're within about 5 or 4 kilometers to be safe, if you're within 4 kilometers of your target, you can pretty much point towards it and burn, and you will get closer. The problem is, seeing as we are orbiting around a 3D shape, our perception of where things are is warped by that. Because we're travelling around in circles, not a straight line. Here we are, coming up. Now, I said earlier we got lucky, and we did because our separation was different, our inclination was drastically different. But it just so happened that by burning at the correct time, we managed to get those one of those two points to line up with the orbit at exactly the same time the lander was going to be there. It was a bit of a chance rendezvous, and I expect for most of you, it might take a little bit longer to actually get the rendezvous. But persistence is key. So we keep burning, we try and put our prograde marker over the pink reticule that tells us where the ship is, or alternatively the retrograde marker over the pink reticule that tells us where the ship isn't, um, do exactly the same thing. There we go, we've cancelled out our relative velocity by burning retrograde to the target, um, and we are now just trying to wheedle our way in. We're about 15.8 metres away, that means we can point ourselves north, because we are docking nose to nose and the target ship is currently pointing south. Um, I recommend, again, again another recommendation, you should point yourselves north or south. Uh, that means that you won't go head over, head over heels every time you orbit a planet. You will, in fact, uh, stay pointing in that one direction and rotate along the centre of axis, the, the central, central axis. Anyway, the point is, we can point towards it and then we can RCS our way in because our thrusters are along the centre of mass like they're supposed to be. That was pure chance. Pure, no, it wasn't. We did, those, we did that first thing beforehand, but uh, it was good that we got it this close. We shall use the RCS controls to get ourselves in, turn everything off, drift forwards and attach. And there we go. That's basically... Excuse me. That's basically the hardest part of the mission over and done with. Or at least this part of the mission. We have to get back now. Which, as I've said, is easier than getting to Juno, so it shouldn't present us with any massive problems. Bill Kerman first, getting out, going to swap back over to our command module. If we don't have much fuel left, and we certainly have loads left, we do not need to do this, but if you don't have much fuel left in your command module, you may want to ditch the lander. It's just more weight you're carrying around for really no reason. But I want to take it home because I've got some rock samples in there I want my Kerbin scientists to analyse. That, that's a joke. There aren't any rock samples in the game yet. Although there should be. There really, really should be. But, um, okay, this is how we get back. Returning to the actual tutorial of this video. Because we are in a higher orbit, Juna is in a higher orbit than Kerbin, we need to be on the light side of Juna, so directly underneath the sun, and we can set up our node that will allow us to burn prograde and thus lower our solar, or bola, seeing as Kerbal, uh, lower our orbit. If you are in a smaller orbit and wanting a higher orbit, you need to be on the opposite side of the sun, burning prograde, going around 90 degrees, it says, assuming you are orbiting in 90 degrees, because I always do, so why wouldn't you? Um, and if you want to lower your orbit, you need to... If you're on a higher orbit lowering, lowering your orbit, you need to be on the sun side of the planet, going 90 degrees, going prograde. And just burn. Just burn, and you will, you will change your orbit, and hopefully get your Kerbin encounter. We are about 75 degrees ahead of it, so our alignment is almost perfect. Perfect enough for just perfect enough for us to just do that one burn and get away with it. And if you look at the Delta V, it doesn't require a ludicrous amount of fuel. In fact, we get back with so much fuel, I was half tempted just to leave it in orbit and go again. <laughs> go straight back. We can repack parachutes and we have enough fuel to refuel the lander from our command module. We probably could have done it. We probably could have all gone to a different planet, seeing as Juno may be a bit boring to some of you. But anyway, here we are again. 
You can see our estimated burn says five minutes left, and we are burning one minute through. But I, I didn't, I just missed the commentating. That opposite engine was still active. That's LV-99, the, the rascal, it was pointing back towards the ship and burning at the same time. It was cancelling out our burn. Uh, hopefully you saw that in time, but um, yeah, our estimated burn time was about six minutes, which is ridiculously long for two engines pushing this lighter ship. Um, but yeah, that was why. It's now gone, on, gone down to about two minutes, 20 seconds. Uh, the only reason it was that long in the first place was because the LV-99 was counteracting us. Ah, man, man, watch out, that could have been fatal, that could have been, we could have wasted all our fuel. A, we're burning with an inefficient engine as well, the AVA LV-99, and it's pointing backwards. Ah, I ought to have checked, but no worries, I know it's a bit long and I checked back and everything is absolutely fine. We are coming up nearly, nearly in sync with our flight planning. Because we didn't get it, we did, our alignment wasn't actually perfect. So you can see we actually drop a bit below to try and make up for that. A bit below Kerbin's orbit. But anyway, we get rid of that target flight planning. And we just adjust, we just adjust until the closest approach gets so close that we get our encounter with the sphere of influence. There we go. And we can actually carry on burning. I'm using RCS right now just to lower the periapsis as far as it'll go. That's about one million, that's about four, about one million, about one million meters above the surface. And as I was saying earlier, I think this was in the last part now, um, when you change sphere of influence, the numbers do actually go a bit astray sometimes. Oh, look at that flickering skyline. That's, that's not good. Or space line. <laughs> oh yes, Harvey, you with your, your thumbnail posing. I do this way too much. I, I get obsessed with thumbnails. I just want to point them in the right direction, and get a good get a good lineup. Because in order to get them now, I need to do it in the video. Because if I don't, then I have to go back, do the whole mission again, and take the picture. I have to do it whilst I'm recording, at least, or whilst I'm playing the game. Uh, but here we go. We are orbiting. We are. We have set our trajectory to encounter Kerbin. Now we are just warping round. Hopefully we won't miss it, because we're not looking at the map view. Uh, but hopefully we will just warp round, get ever closer, and everything will be dandy. But there is one thing left to do. As we carry on time warping, it now says 4 million meters. There you go. We left Juno's sphere of influence, and that changed from being 1 million to being 4 million. Or it could have been my fault, so I could have done something stupid I didn't notice. But anyway, here we are. So, what are we going to do about this? We're not actually going to hit Kerbin at this rate. Well, looking at our trajectory, we seem to be going directly in front of it. So if we point upwards, away from the sun, then we should actually be able to raise our line just to scrape the atmosphere. And you can see it's working. We actually got a moon encounter there, but no worries. Uh, we just raise it and raise it and raise it, and until we get it about 400,000 meters off of the surface change sphere of influence and that brings itself up to what does it say about 1 million meters now judging from memory yeah about about 10 million meters see things don't remain consistent kids that's what you've got to learn about life um says a kid <laughs> uh now our trajectory is to the right of it um so if we think in terms of a 90 degree orbit we actually need to burn towards the west, 270 degrees. Just bring it left so that we come upwards. And actually you can see it is below it, so to come upwards, we need to point a bit north as well. And you can see it rising just there. It, getting back is something you have to learn. Learn to, to find intuitive rather than listening to one tell you, because every circumstance is different, and that's the fatal flaw with some of my Kerbin, some of my Kerbal tutorials. But whatever the case, hopefully this series, this short series of three videos, has actually been helpful to some people. I certainly hope it has. If you have any questions, you can, of course, drop me them in the comments. As we warp down, what are we going to do now? Well, we're going to get rid of that full tank because the massive amounts of fuel in there are going to do naught but to weigh us down. And we can perhaps open up our parachutes, or at least prepare to open them, and carry on warping. 
I always manage to land on the dark side of the force. No, the dark side of Kerbin. But for some reason, I mean, no matter what I do, it's always the dark side. It, it annoys me because it's not so good for camera angles. Oh, wow. Wow, did you see that flip like that? Yeah, okay, let's not time accelerate as much. Um, I'm keeping the lander. As I've said, I've got rock, rock samples in there. I want to use them. Um, and also, it's got six parachutes on it, which I'm not going to let go to waste. What happens if our parachutes fail? So what we're doing, as we uh, stay strangely pointing in one direction, oh yeah, advanced SES is on, quickly change that, point it in the right way, uh, I'm going to use all the parachutes in sync. Now I hope this will work. The reason we're pointing upside down, opposite to how air resistance wants us to go, is because the more parachutes are on the lander, and that makes it want to go upwards. They open suddenly, and we are there sitting upside down on top of our lander. This isn't exactly ideal to land with though, so I might end up decoupling. And we are practically home! That's the end of the video! Thank you oh so much for watching this. If you'd like to see more videos of this nature, not just the ISSS or test pilot or interplanetary fleet, uh, please do let me know. If you liked the video, then please do like the video. Other than that, I haven't got an awful lot to say. We can undock the thing, flip it out to the side, look at that. And of course we sink lower than it. Uh, we sink faster because it's got more parachutes, the, the idiot. And that is the end. Thank you very much for watching, and I shall see you all next time.